Welcome to this uh, Daily Maverick special launch of um, our latest Hot Off the Press book by our author and investigator Karen Dolly, who's here with me this afternoon. Hello, Karen. Hello. Good afternoon, um, everyone. The book is available at the, the Daily Maverick bookshop uh, if you want it. And um, I'm going to spend the next hour hopefully sort of uh, tracking with Karen how this came to be. Um, it's your second book, Karen, and the, the first... Yes. Uh, being called The Enforcers, which was inside Cape Town's Deadly Nightclubs. And then that wasn't that long ago. Um, but for me, To the Wolves um, is a kind of follow-up of that and provides a more exploded view of what has happened in and around your initial book, which is this capture of the, of the nighttime industry in Cape Town, the deadly capture. Uh, and this very, very tangled knot of criminality and, uh, criminality and law mm -hmm. enforcement, particularly uh, in the Western Cape. And it's a, it's a deadly killing field. Um, what I thought was interesting, and I'd start off with this, Karen, is, is, is that uh, there are a lot of women, interestingly enough, who've written about crime in South Africa. I was thinking that as I read, as I read the book, um, and, and I thought that particularly because of the horrendous terrain that one finds oneself in when one does report on crime and criminality and law enforcement. And before you, there was Marlene Berger, and of course, we've got Mandy Wiener, who's also a, a veteran a reporter, we've got May Jean De Vee <laughs> at Netback Feed and Twinter, who is as uh, you know as involved as, as you are. Uh, we had Pearlie Joubert many years ago writing about crime, particularly in the Western Cape. Myself, very much in the old days, but I'm a hangover from that time. But uh, uh, your kind of involvement is, is at, at a depth that I have seldom seen in terms of um, reporting on, on the networks of crime, po politics, and law enforcement. So um, tell us a little bit about uh, about this book and how, not only that, first of all, how did you come to involve yourself or how did you find yourself taking this on as a, as a beat? Because that's sort of how it happens and then one gets sucked mm. in. Some people do, some people don't, some people can stay the, the distance and some people can't. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. So I got sucked into this totally by default. As an intern reporter, I covered a lot of court cases and a lot of crime crimes so i would go to crime scenes and that's how i built up a network of contacts via going to crime scenes interviewing families interviewing police officers at scenes and on the flip side of this i was going to a lot of court cases and built up lots of court contacts and the two sort of merged and then as I evolved or matured, I hope, as a reporter, I started looking into the political aspects and, for example, who's running Western Cape Provincial Community Safety versus the National Police Commissioner. And it started creating a much bigger, broader picture and understanding. And that's how I ended up here. Yeah. So, so in what in what uh, what period did you then begin that? Because I think you know, as you mentioned, this book from the from the nineteen nineties onwards, things sort of repeat, uh, are, are rinse, repeat, and play, but with different characters. But prior to that, you know, there was apartheid South Africa, and I suppose that's kind of where I wrote about crime. And uh, mm. so, what year do you come in and begin to pick up the pieces in the aftermath of, let's say, ninety four and, and and the beginning of democracy and the opening up of borders? So as you'll see in both The Enforcers and To the Wolves, I touch on apartheid and sort of the switch over from apartheid to democracy. And in To the Wolves, I really start focusing around 1998. So fresh post-democracy. There is a section of the book dedicated to apartheid, but a lot of it is also focusing on just the cusp yeah. and the, okay. the terrible path to where we are now. So, so in a sense, then you're saying, you know, once you started writing about, and you and you're from Cape Town as well, so you're very much you're located in in the geography, of of, uh, in actual fact, what is a low grade civil war that has continued in the mm. suburbs, particular suburbs, for a very long period of time, and there has always been, um, I suppose, state security complicity and government complicity on a on a certain level. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, uh, what was it that after you did the enforcers, um, why did you need to go back and and look at the progression of this and where it's taking us? Because this is also the first book where you have an opinion on what you think should happen. But um, so just just uh, uh, what was the moment you decided, OK, I need to go deeper than this again. I need to look further um, and then place yourself also at great danger at the same time. 
So with the enforcers, I looked at club security or the so-called bouncer battles in the Western Cape and also Gauteng, etc. But I looked at it through the lens of the suspects. So it focused a lot on what happened in court and the who's who, who's been accused of what. And with To the Wolves, I've looked at the same subject through the lens of policing. And the first book really gave me a step or a leg up to this book. And what made me go back was basically I was out of journalism for about a year working at a lovely nonprofit organization, Open Secrets, that was a punt. Um, and yeah, during my time away from journalism, I decided in my spare time to go and read notes, things I had written years ago that I haven't really had a chance to analyze and think and see it in the context that I can now see it. And through doing that, I realized maybe I should start making my own notes and trying to piece together what is definitely a broader puzzle here. Because with the enforcers, I focused on one tiny aspect or what in retrospect is one tiny aspect. So I went back, reread all my notebooks from 2010, 2011, 2012. So you keep your notebooks? You keep your notebooks? I cannot confirm nor deny. <laughs> I keep my notebooks. <laughs> and and you can read your handwriting and you keep, you, I mean, you've got stacks of, you, you, you just file away and keep everything, not necessarily to be used immediately, but to hold on to in some way. Absolutely. And it's always interesting to see something I wrote 10 years ago that meant nothing 10 years ago. To me now, it's like, oh my word, this is so critical and pivotal to this issue. So yeah, I started writing what was basically a diary for myself. And as I started writing, I added end notes slash footnotes and it became this manuscript. So it was really trying to understand from my perspective what had happened via the lens of policing. And also to track trace back that in actual fact, I don't think this region has ever had a, a, um, a law enforcement capacity that serves the people. So uh, I also just, you know, when you talk, your, one of your first chapters is the obliterated blue line, you know, which is where, where it begins and this in, entrenched criminality. And as I read your book, I realized that there are more names here of famous gangsters that I can remember or hold on to uh, um, than I do of politicians or activists who were um, around at the time. I mean, we've got Vicky Koswami, we've got uh, Noor Edwards, Rashid and Rashad Stahi, Lastach Solomon, uh, Cyril Beaker. I mean, so uh, from the 1990s. So just take us into how these people come to establish themselves, if you can, you can see it from the period that you looked at, to, the, uh, to where we are now, which is a critical point which you mentioned in the book in terms of the outward display of the full-on war. So if you look at Vicky Koswami, for example, he is from India and he's currently, he's apparently jailed in the US. He is a Mandrax dealer of note. So he claimed that he got involved with the ANC pre-democracy. And the, it appears that these ties may have flowed over into democracy. And there are suspicions that Vicky Goswami worked with Colin Stanfield. He was a local alleged gangster who was jailed for tax evasion, if memory serves correct. So I use that as an example because this was apartheid, fresh democracy. And then in 2014, Vicky Goswami was allegedly involved in a murder and he testified in the US just two years ago saying they wanted to show that they force or power in South Africa to maintain control of the Mandrax trade. So you can see the very people that were problematic back then are still problematic. And in with Colin Stanfield, for example, we've now got his nephew, Ralph Stanfield, who's facing serious criminal charges. So it's generational, it's cyclical. Everything that happened back then, we've got Rashid Stahi, for example, who was murdered fairly recently. And he was believed to have worked for apartheid era police officers. Mm -hmm. Well, I also you have the um, the history then also of uh, the people like uh, Dr. Death, Voto Basson and others, in a sense, um, aiding and abetting the, the physical growth of the of the drug trade and of of gangsterism in a sense, and using I suppose gangsters as as informers for uh, for the apartheid state. So already there, the messy line just disappears, and uh, already we know the apartheid cop system is is corrupt uh, on many ways the only job is to arrest mm -hmm. activists and you know find them guilty so pre-1990 what what happens uh, you know there's an opportunity we have 
for the South African police service then to, to become different. But by then, what do you think has entrenched itself in the SAPs, particularly in the Western Cape, because this is a port, a port city, major port city and transit area and borders open up? Absolutely. So in the Western Cape, we are known as the gang epicenter of South Africa. We do have a gang situation problem of scheme note. In the 90s, a number of gangsters were used, or not even the 90s, earlier than that, apartheid operatives used gangsters, as you said, to spy on political opponents, etc. And Cape Town is unique because we also have a group of serving and former, and in one case, fired police officers who worked against the apartheid state. And all these individuals were absorbed into the same or amalgamated police service. And that's where we have a lot of friction. So we've got police officers who, I don't want to say spied on, but they were aware of what apartheid operatives and cops were up to. And these cops and operatives could have been aware of what the so-called rivals were up to. And they were all observed excuse me, all absorbed into the police service. And that's, we still see the same cracks and fissures today. We still see that. So what I try and argue or try and show is that suspicions of gangsters working with police officers and operatives, et cetera, those remain. There's nothing to suggest it didn't end after apartheid. In fact, we've got allegations that Jacob Zuma met with gangsters and not just once and those Claims and allegations don't come from dubious sources as such. These are sources who often provide factual information. And in fact, Duduzani, who's also got presidential uh, uh, ambitions too, was seen with, with a particular generation, this next generation. I'm quite interested in the fact that Mandrax is so much a part of, still of the, of the drug trade in, in South mm. Africa. When you think about... Um, um, other drugs such as cocaine and methamphetamine and tuck, which really have become a problem. And Mandrax is very much a 1980s uh, a mm -hmm. drug. Uh, have you got any thoughts on, on why it's remained popular when there's so many other kind of drugs that are freely flowing from one place to another? Well, I assume money. Mm -hmm. So what I looked at is these sort of drug channels crafted and created in the 1980s and 1990s, and those still exist. Without a doubt, those channels still exist and are still being used. I think it's just expanded a lot more. And if you, the book says Cape Town was the Mandrax capital of the world. The Western Cape was the Mandrax capital of the world. So, I mean, why stop something if you can just continue pumping it out and making money out of it? But as you say, sort of later on in the book, you know, uh, the, the, we've all known this. You know, that's what is uh, why, why I like so much that you consolidate your ideas at the back for many, many, many years. So you would think then, uh, new dispensation, let's try and protect our communities from, from these drug dealers. But at the same time, borders are opening up. Uh, contestation is starting to happen for various kinds of products to be sold and marketed on the black market. And then you have the entrance of these ex-former MK uh, uh, policemen. And let's begin with them, um, because uh, what I also just wanted to say about Karen's book that I haven't seen before is that um, you sort of introduce each chapter with a vignette, um, which very much reads like fiction to those of us who don't know the realities, but it's very true. Shootings in restaurants, shootings in streets, assassinations, children being maimed for life. So throughout your text where you uh, telling us each of the characters and where they belong and, and where they don't belong, and sometimes we don't know, you very much are grounded in the actual effects this has on, on communities. I mean, that to me is very clear, that you never really distance yourself um, from what's happening to communities. And throughout the book, I keep wondering, don't these corrupt cops and don't the gangsters see the suffering? You know, does it, you know, does somebody here not see what's happening? Um, was that also something that, that drove your, your explorations of this? Absolutely. And I say so. It's fatal state capture. What has happened within the police service is fatal state capture. And we are seeing that on the ground with shootings, etc. So it was very important for me to keep in mind for myself and for readers that, yes, this may be a fight between police officers here and a minister may be saying this against a commissioner or a general here. But on the ground, the impact there is horrific. 
I agree. And, and I think that's why it's also difficult for people sometimes to try and hold on to who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. And, and who do we trust and who don't we trust? And I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. But um, just back to the 1990s again, this all starts with Cyril Beaker uh, and, and the confusion uh, around who's aligned with whom. Uh, who is in bed with whom begins with this murder of of of, of Beaker, and I think it's it's you know, if you read the book and you know all the characters, you can hold on to them. I'm not sure for the web, but now whether it's important to go through it all. But already there, you have a link where there's suspicions he's an informer, and then it turns out actually he's an NK operative and deeply involved in the underworld. You know? Yes, yeah, so throughout the book we've got it's almost like a similar theme applied to certain suspects. We had Cyril Beaker, who was known as a so-called bouncer boss, but there were also suspicions that he was working for the apartheid government. At the same time, there were suspicions he'd actually turned and he was working for MK operatives. So I describe him as something of a political mirage. We just can't actually tell what he was doing and. Perhaps the answer is, like with other suspects we're seeing, that he followed the money and he was involved with all of those spheres as power and money shifted. And um, we, for example, at the moment, we've got Mr. Nafiz Modak in court on various charges, and he knew Cyril Beaker. And it's another example of how it seems that criminal suspicions have almost sort of transferred generationally so Nafiz Modak is involved or was involved in nightclub security, so was Cyril Beaker. There are suspicions that Nafiz Modak claims that he's working with certain police officers. The same can be applied to Cyril Beaker. So it feels like we're sitting in the same sort of clasp. Mm, yes. And then we have the entrance, let's say, of the NK Brigade. And, and, and in a sense, there's a lot of controversy around this. It's, it's Andre Lincoln, Peter Jacobs, and Jeremy Veary, all of them from the Western Cape. Uh, anyone who's read Jeremy's book, Jeremy Funny Elsies, will know uh, of, of, of Veary's history in NK uh, as a writer, as a Marxist, as a maverick uh, cop, but as somebody who has put away some, you know, some pretty bad uh, um, gang, you know, gang leaders. Um, Jacobs also very, the, the three of them very tight and very close and seeing also and living in communities, uh, understanding the, the various historical threads around gangs and control and everything else. They enter the, the picture, you know, post-democracy. And, and what do we see happening there, Karen? What do, you, what do you see happening with that? And where does that take us to where we are now? So with each one of them, starting with General Lincoln, he headed an investigation back in the 1990s, 1997, if I'm correct. He looked into allegations that police officers were involved with Vito Palazzolo, an alleged mm. Italian mafioso, and other criminal suspects on the ground, including Rashid Strachi. So General L Lincoln looked into issues involving cop complicity. Then we've got General Veri, who also quite, I think, around 2000, 2003, he looked into cop complicity in gang crimes. And then we've got Peter Jacobs, who up until recently was the head of crime intelligence before controversially being transferred. Together with General Veri, they more recently looked into how police officers were involved in channeling firearms to gangsters. So with each one of these three police officers, that's Lincoln, Veri, and Jacobs, they've each looked into massive sort of masses of crime involving cop complicity. And in each case, they've been dealt with blows. So for example, General Lincoln was accused of crime and eventually shoved out the police service. He was then acquitted and got back in. We've had General Veri and General Jacobs who have been transferred in the case of Jacobs twice within the lot over the last few years as they've been heading investigations. And as we recently saw with General Veri, he was fired. He's faced immense mountains of claims that he's involved in organized crime. And it's just unbelievable that he's been fired because of Facebook posts. Yes, well, it shows you what they could actually nail him on. But, but you also mentioned in the book that Veri has faced in his 26-year career at that time, from the beginning, um, a resistance to, to uh, an attempt to create a South African police service 
um, that that subscribes to the constitution. And I mean, you know, you realize that not one single police commissioner, uh, apart from George Fivers at the very beginning, has survived uh, their tenure. Uh, without being, you know, without leaving in, in, in some kind of disgrace. So we have that, we have that systemic issue there as well. But the Western Cape in itself, as, uh, um, uh, I wanted to bring in here Charles Kinnear at this particular point, because Charles doesn't come from an ANC MK background. Charles is one of those, um, those cops that you and I know exist, um, who do their jobs at great risk. Um, in fact, we've just had a bust in Joburg now of a ski boat with, you know, four, yes. 400 million rands worth. Now, those, those are cops that are actually on the ground doing their work um, while this sort of other leadership battle, uh, you know, plays itself out. Tell us a little bit about where Kinnia fits in, in between those cops who have been accused in the Western Cape of being part of a rogue crime intelligence unit and you know, uh, why they would be attached, uh, according to those who allege it, is that there's a this factionalism that Jacob Zuma appointed Patlani. Patlani is, you know, uh, um, is, is linked to a wider network. He himself has been charged with corruption. And they make several changes in the Western Cape, bring in people who don't know the Western Cape. But Vary and Jacobs are viewed with suspicion, Vary because of his independence of mind, and Jacobs because, you know, he's pretty quiet and ruthless about what he does. Um, uh, so, so we have the situation. So, to talk to us a bit about where Kinnear fits in to all of this. So, Colonel Kinnear worked under General Veri. General Veri used to head up the Mitchell's Plain cluster of police stations. And while Colonel Kinnear was there, he was he set up sort of a, a unit looking into gangsters. So, he's viewed widely viewed as being aligned to the Jeremy Veri's, Andre Lincoln's, and Peter Jacobs, and. In December 2018, Colonel Kinnear wrote a very long letter of complaint to his bosses, and in it he alleged that there were certain police officers in the Western Cape with links to crime intelligence who were actively working against him and his colleagues, including Veri and Lincoln. And Peter Jacob subsequently found that the unit or the grouping of police officers in this province that Colonel Kinnear complained about, he found that it's a rogue unit and should be disbanded. That hasn't happened, which suggests that either this doesn't exist, there's no will to tackle this so-called unit, or there are a counter set of claims, and there are probably a counter set of claims. So we also have a provincial sort of uh, leadership that is unable to deal with these issues, particularly when Komikosi Jula is brought into the Western Cape from the from KZN, and he brings with him uh, um, Zwandeli Tio, who takes over crime intelligence, and that's a very controversial posting. Uh, and it's very clear that you know there's a sidelining of of Jacobs and and Vary for whatever reason. Um, and Vary has complained also that this this constant clash between police who believe themselves to be in factions and aligned to various underworld uh, 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 leaders and gangs has completely compromised the ability to actually do the work that they're supposed to do. So, But between all of that, Vary and the rest of them get on with, a, with an investigation. And let's talk about that investigation because it leads to the arrest of Kobus Prinsu, who is a brigadier in the SAPs, in the tell us a little bit about that and that and, and I'm, I'm bringing it in because it, it all ties in in the end in terms of us being thrown to the wolves so just to keep in mind that when colonel Kinnear was assassinated in september he was part of a team investigating allegations that police officers were fraudulently creating firearm licenses for suspects in the western cape so that was more recently if we go back a few years when General Vieri and General Jacobs were both based in the Western Cape, and General Jacobs was the provincial crime intelligence head, they ran an investigation codenamed Project MP, which also looked at how police officers were effectively channeling firearms to gangsters. And that led to its, um, yeah, Chris Prinsler's arrest, a former police officer who then confessed to selling it's many firearms to a businessman in the Western Cape who is now alleged to have sort of pumped those firearms out to gangsters. So in both these cases, the General Ferry and General Jacobs investigation and the investigation Colonel Kinnear was involved in, as was Andre Lincoln, it's looking at 
pumping firearms to gangsters in the Western Cape and cop complicity. And, and of course, that investigation takes them beyond the borders of the Western Cape as well and takes them to KZN um, and where they begin to make connections between the gun running and the taxi industry, which is a particular problem in KZN. So you have uh, you have these. I'm always surprised that, that SAPS didn't trumpet the victory of putting Prince Lou in jail for 20 years. It hardly blipped on their radar when this man who was selling 9,000 guns is the estimated uh, number at the end of it. 9,000 guns back into into uh, into the mm. townships. It's just just yeah. unthinkable. I wanted to just read um, for people something because I thought this is what I what your book is about. Ultimately, it's page 400 and 246. Um, when we speak about the guns that have been sold by the cops back to back to gangsters. Three-year-old Brian Diamond was playing in front of his Heinz Park home in July 2006 when a bullet from a nearby gang fight penetrated his head. His mom was wounded in the stomach but was not as badly injured as her son. Against many odds, the little boy survived but was left brain dead. Brian was unable to talk and only had limited movement. His family struggled to ensure that he received the special milk needed to nourish him. And as the years rolled by, he outgrew his wheelchair and rely he relied on. Brian was moved into a single bed in his home. This is where he celebrated his 17th birthday. Um, you know, that's a direct result uh, of what happened um, under, I suppose, various police commissioners' watches, including Fiega and Sitoli. You know, um, uh, what, what was that? Those children's names also, interestingly enough, were included in the indictment. What, what are your thoughts about that? Because that was quite an unusual move. And I think it was at the prompting of the investigating officers. So what you said earlier, Marianne, about it, it seemed unusual that Chris Prinsler's arrest and conviction, etc., didn't make like bigger news or it wasn't it did make big news actually it just wasn't really hyped by police bosses you know it got to a certain level and well I think the same month he was convicted and or sentenced with the same month that with the same month that General Vieri and General Jacobs were transferred from Project MP and that that highlights something amiss to me Perhaps I'm reading too much into it, but why transfer to police officers who are unraveling not just a Western Cape issue, something that even goes across South Africa's borders with regards to illegal firearms channels. Something just doesn't seem right there. And that brings us back to what Colonel Kamir was investigating. And the harsh reality is that they, there's a document in court papers linked to General Vieri and General Jacobs transfers, they approached the Labour Court and they were successful in overturning their transfers. There's a document that lists the names of 261 children who were either shot, maimed, or killed with Project MP identified firearms. And that to me is the core and the you know the the reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the features of the book that I also found um, maddening, and not the, not the writing, but the issue that we as journalists find maddening, is to um, analyze the information that comes to us, because the media has also been used in this in this very very bitter war um, by various people uh, in order to smear uh, particular cops and others. And both you and I, um, or you so more than I know, know that we meet sources. You know, you, you speak here about it's simply not clear to the public to whom this is applicable because of the bombardment of claims from all quarters. So there seems to be this deliberate attempt at, at, at confusing the narrative um, with MODAC launching a, a court action against uh, you know, someone else for saying, for arresting you or saying something. Um, when did you draw a line in the sand and decide, I see here, uh, one can't say it because you have to. We always have to allege when we write, and we have the documents, and much of almost everything you've written is based on court documents and and various information that's out there in the public. But what is your feeling around that playing with one sense of trust and belief, and how do you um, judge? I suppose what you just said earlier on, the principally went to jail. You know, 
they were withdrawn from their positions. Just your thoughts around the maddening confusion that's created there for you as the writer and then also for the readers. So if you look at the two opening quotes of the book, they are deliberately, obviously deliberately chosen, but they refer to STRATCOM, which was the apartheid era communications mechanism, which was basically pumping out information to suit a particular agenda, both information and disinformation. And that's part of my argument saying that this blueprint from apartheid is still being followed. There are elements of STRATCOM that are being implemented now. And I think it's obviously used to tarnish not just reputations, but investigations. And that, I mean, we've seen this with the South African Revenue Service. Mm -hmm. It is part and parcel of the state capture monster is to pump out disinformation. And there's no reason to think or assume it wouldn't have got to the police service. But you've been you, you you you've been very cautious um, in in your reporting, and as you should be, and have you know, um, others have been accused of, and have and and particular newspapers have had to to uh, apologise for publishing stories which uh, are planted. What is is that because journalists just seem to want to get a scoop? Uh, is it because they sort of believe? the disinformation they've been fed, including a, a clipped tape conversation, which turns out to be untrue. Is, do they not spend enough time analyzing what it is they need to do? I mean, how does it happen that the media still gets used? Um, I would assume because we don't have enough checks in place at certain points. So if I've worked in a much faster paced newsroom before I've been at Daily Maverick and at you just go, go, go. And that's where breaking news first needs to be treated with a huge dose of salt. Just be careful, be cautious. And I'm not sure in those cases how the information was actually presented to the journalists. I'm not sure if they got sort of official documents or documents that purported to be official. But I think more and more we're realizing how huge a monster state capture is. And I think the more we realize it, the more caution we have to apply to any information that crosses us. Yeah. Have, have you also found yourself under pressure and under threat, um, particularly earlier on? So just tell us a little bit about that, because that's part of the narrative, too, is that mm. those uh, of us covering it or trying to cover it and, and in a sense, put a stop to it, find ourselves also in the in uh, as a target. So, so tell us a little bit about your earlier experiences and um, and right now. Of course. Um, I did see someone asked, have you been gonna, under threat? We're going we're gonna to get to those questions now. We're going to get right there. Cool. So when I was covering the Project Impi saga, when General Vieri and General Jacobs went to the Labour Court to overturn their transfers, which, like I said earlier, they were successful in, when they were successful, I requested the court papers and that included the affidavits, etc. And I reported on that and it showed the absolute far-reaching reach of Project MP that it wasn't just about one channel of firearms, etc., and also the political aspect with regards to it. And I'll never forget, it was a Friday at 5.11 p.m. because I was very excited to go home after a very long work week. I received an SMS saying, Miss Dolly, those firearms are going to be used on your head those firearms the cops are going to be used on your head, at your mother's house, on your dog. I want to point out that my surname was spelled incorrectly and the reference to a dog mm. hinted at who may have sent that message. Um, it came from one of those mass SMS sending numbers. So that was one case. In another case, I was tipped off that a suspect and a person of prominence would be at a hotel in Cape Town and I went to the hotel I didn't really want to but my editor was like go and I photographed the suspect and the person of prominence and it turned out to be Nafiz Modak and the Northern Cape Police Commissioner. After that when I asked him via email what he may have been doing there I received an email back with a photograph of myself at the hotel and subject lined we have eyes everywhere which came across as intimidation, which he denied. So be that as it may. And then, as you're aware, Marian, there is the constant, oh, um, careful what you say on your phone, your communications are being monitored. Um, 
it's it's there constantly. The constant weird warnings, etc. Or maybe you shouldn't report on that because you know that's what I get from some aspects of contacts. So yeah. But you, but you, but you continue. I mean, uh, you know, nothing puts you off from doing this. I mean, uh, uh, because you know, one could just walk away from it and say, like Jeremy Deary or anybody else who don't do it, you know, uh, or or the good cops who don't walk away from the from the mess and stay there. So you know, uh, big big up to you for doing that. Let's get to some of the questions that I want people to feel left out at all. Um, and I'm not specifically drilling down into the book um, because there is a lot in it. And I, and I feel that, you you know, um, Karen's pulled it together in such a way that um, you get a, a real sense of the underlying problem. And it's not as if we didn't know it, but you make it clearer. And because of this, we can perhaps try and fix it. And we'll talk just now about some of your ideas that you, that you put forth in the book. Um, uh, Craig Morrison writes, do citizens who handed in firearms have any recourse if their firearms were used in gang or criminal violence? Um, I would I not suppose, know. I wouldn't know. I suppose if the numbers are filed off, no, uh, we don't know. Uh, in your view, did Project MP significantly disrupt the flow of arms from cops to gangs? What do you think? I think for a short while it did. Like it must have sort of had everyone backing off, but I don't think... I don't think it had the long-term intention it set out to try and achieve because it was sort of cut off before. Yeah, yes. it's cut it's off rather it's abruptly. abruptly. Rather abruptly. Um, there's another one here. Considers your books into docudramas? Um, I'm sure yes, but time, uh, money. <laughs> and I just, you know, Karen, also, I just wanted to, to mention this because um, I, yeah, I think it's important in the sense that when you finish this book, you suddenly became really ill. And what people don't realize is that one holds the tension of these stories and being in this world. Um, and you've done so for a very, very long time. Do you feel that, that, that somehow while your brain was not afraid and your brain was writing and, and as a journalist you were doing this job, but somewhere in your body you held a, a real fear and tension, I suppose, which manifested itself? Absolutely. I think the most, um, well, the most difficult aspect was having this information in my head and trying to get people to understand this broader picture of state capture and what it means on the ground, grappling with that and not quite knowing how to get that out in 2,000, 3,000 words. It was kind of like, will people ever get to know this? Mm -hmm. Because we can't do anything without understanding the nature of the beast. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that contributed to me being ill. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But we're hoping you're on the mend, and we, we're sure you will be. Um, Karen, do you have bodyguards? Do you fear for your safety from Shamila? Um, I want to say I do, just to pretend that I do, but I don't have bodyguards. And I'm sure Marianne can also answer in terms of our safety. It's a bit weird. Like, you go on with your life, and then you hear a motorbike, which is an Uber Eats driver, and you think, ooh, assassin. You just wired to think a little differently, but yeah. We live around it. Uh, Monique Stradom, Monique, hello, thank you that you enlisted. Monique also does incredible work in the community. She says, how can we make a community difference in addressing this corruption? And and maybe we'll save that for, for just now because yes. that's kind of where you go um, uh, behind your book. Uh, Gabrielle asks, Gabrielle Lezinski, what was behind Prince being released only four years? Is it a deal? Well, uh, we can't speak about it now, I think. Um, I think it's known. Uh, do you want to, to, to inform Gabriel why, why Prince Lou was let out on early parole? Or he's if it been, even was that? Yeah, I don't think it was early parole. I do believe he's in the witness protection program and is set to potentially testify in the big guns to gangs case that has emanated from Project MP. Yeah, so that's uh, that's why he's there. Um, I think his possible testimony will uh, make a lot of people quite edgy as well. So he was, uh, I think, moved from one, um, Jean Devy wrote about it as well, and used to admit that from one prison to another under different names, because you can imagine uh, people are very afraid of what Prince Lou has to say. And perhaps what, you know, Vary still has to testify in a very big case uh, now, supposedly on suspension. But uh, Corky Rose, Karen, have you been threatened in any way? Yes, we've got those. We've done that one. Um, and what's and I think that's why the Western Cape stands out, because it had these intense gangs operating around the province, across the borders, etc. And that's where apartheid cops sort of paired up with them. 
and then we've seen it bleeding into democracy and now. And then we, we also have the, the other convergence, which is we do know that many ANC uh, members in exile uh, in order to sort of find money for guns and various other stuff also traded in mandrakes and diamonds and various other illicit um, uh, whatevers, you know, that, so, so that, you know, in order to survive that uh, what is what 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 does them call it? That culture was was uh, inculcated. And earlier on, uh, while we were in the groom room, we spoke about people like Keith Keating and FDA, who is still at loggerheads with SAPS, uh, a private individual who sells the entire IT system, case management system, uh, firearm permit system to the SAPS, and then keeps switching it off because you know the deal is is you know so the and he's an ex. A warrant officer, and I'm not saying you know he's won several court cases so far because SAPS has always been on the on the back foot. So what you're saying then is that there's no way we could have built uh, a new South African police service with the remnants of what was there. And then we had Jackie Salebi also bringing in recruits um, in a sense. Um, does that does that still uh, I think underpin much of the uh, lack of I suppose qualifications for of many of our of our our young cops or the cops who were young then? Well, I, like you said, it, it's almost like with the Mandrax trade, etc. It seems to be inculcated. So my my theory slash argument is that if the police service was so fragmented to start off with, and in so many ways, and we've got sort of you know overtly criminal cops, and then we've got cops with political alliances and allegiances, and then we've got cops bringing their own recruits in, and then we've got cops promoting people they see themselves to be aligned with. There's so many just, I don't even know what to call it, but so many cracks. I think those cracks have never actually, nothing has bridged them, nothing has mended them. They've always been there. And following Colonel Kinnear's murder, I think it was just magnified and zoomed in on. And we're seeing a lot more friction and tension now. And we're seeing a repetition again of, of we have uh, uh, clearly the police minister in a sense straying out of his lane and, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Sitoli also being accused of being part of a plot to buy a grabber for 45 million mm -hmm. rand just prior to, um, to Nasrek. Uh, so you have the commissioner again facing uh, uh, some sort of inquiry. You have the minister of police who himself was a minister, who was a commissioner. And, and also, you know, so, so um, Karen, what, what, what does it mean for us as, as ordinary people? What is it, you know, you get to the end of the book and you say, look at it's here, it's wash, rinse, repeat, different names. We have good cops under pressure who are, are hounded uh, through the use of state resources, as you say, a, kind of the larger state capture narrative where those who are perpetrating or doing illegal things are using the resources they have to get rid of. I mean, the fight is just at the top all the time. What do we do at the bottom? What is there for us? So what I point out is that we are stuck and sometimes we don't even realize that we're stuck in this fight. And it's a huge fight. And the fight is we've got cops claiming other cops are involved in crime. We've got cops involved in crime. And we've got these cops involving those cops are involved in crime. So it's a crossfire of claims and we are trapped in the middle. And what I try and do with this book is show the crossfire of claims so that we can understand what is happening and we can act. And it's as simple as if there is a very junior police officer who is, I don't know, accepting a 200 grand bribe or something, we need to act, we need to speak out. And we also need to unify and sort of try, we need to see this beast for what it is, understand it, unify and fight back. Um, but, but you know, surely we have the National uh, Development Plan sort of set out for, for the creation of this, of this new service and how we are going to appoint commissioners or provincial commissioners or other people. Um, but uh, you know, do you see, I mean, IPED itself too, uh, if you look at um, the work Robert McBride did while he was the director of IPED, we see many of the uh, court appearances now of, of, of very senior cops is as a result of that work at IPED. So IPED itself too. Um, becomes a very, very important component of this, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be showing any uh, appetite uh, because in a sense, would it result in the entire police top structure collapsing? We have Lieutenant General Vuma, who is implicated uh, herself in PPE irregularities, investigating Jacobs. So it almost seems 
literally impossible, Karen, to 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 clean the ranks. I mean, uh, but I'm not saying we should despair. But um, um, you know, does this national development plan mean anything? And 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 where do we go from here? Because Kinnear's death cannot be allowed to, in a sense, what the Kinnear's death also, as you say in the book, exposes is how the uh, how the private security industry and our telephone networks have been have been complicit in in actually enabling criminals to follow people ping them and kill them it's it's uh you know it's it's uh but maybe until we do a, a class action lawsuit nothing will change well that's what i'm saying instead of waiting for a plan or you know hoping and waiting i do feel that we need to in whatever way we each personally can, we need to try and do something. So for me, it was writing this book and exposing something or trying to expose something. For another person, it could be reporting a crooked police officer. It can be banding together and it can be a class act and saying enough is enough. This can't go on. We should not allow this to happen. If police officers can't protect themselves, if police officers are being killed, and there are suspicions that other police officers, to whatever extent, may have been complicit or who may have allowed a situation to develop, then, you know, where does that leave us? We must fend for ourselves. Well, I'm not saying we can get no, guns no, and no, things and no, say no, no. fire but, mines. But uh, where, where does this leave us if, let's say, somebody like a Jeremy Veary um, does not succeed in challenging this preposterous i mean in in the 26 years that jeremy and, and peter jacobs have have been hounded they've not pinned a single case on any of them they've you know there's been absolutely no conviction or proof of anything but let's say jeremy is 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 now excluded from from saps well, you know uh, what what is the what what is that possibility what does that mean for us i don't know what it means for us but i do know that we can stand up for ourselves so regardless of what it means to us, we need to take a stand. We need to do something. We need to back. Where we see cops are doing good work, we need to back that. Where we see cops are doing wrong, we need to expose that. And further than that, I, I wish I could be like, here's the plan, <laughs> ABC. I, yeah, I think I think communities where, who suffer from this lawlessness, in a sense, are absolutely tired, uh, fatigued, mm -hmm. and, and, and don't even trust the cops. Um, uh, you, know, I, I, you both of us know, I, well, I have a, a friend who is in the cops who was shot with, with a police gun. He was shot four times and then wanted to get out of hospital to continue doing his work. So, you know, it's not that that doesn't doesn't exist. Um, um, uh, Jeremy Veary made a statement after he was told that he was being dismissed. Um, and in that statement, he did mention that he would be willing to work with any organization uh, that was thinking of perhaps holding the SAPs and the minister to account mm -hmm. for. I mean, you just read that one um the end result of someone's life destroyed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that as a as a as a big stick or as a way of of finally getting those families whose children have died or who have who are still in need of medical assistance because of their guns? Uh, do you think that that's a way? I think it's a way to highlight an issue, whether they succeed or not. I mean, a class action is something huge. It could take years. We, you know, legally. From what I've been told, it is something that really could take 10 x many years. We've seen some court cases, for example, the Project MP1 that has been in court for several years. But I don't think we should view it as um, a court case. It's also about highlighting an issue. So through that, regardless of where this legal action may end, it is a a platform on which to highlight something that is fundamentally wrong. And I saw um, General Lemur, hi General, he mentioned this is the tip of the iceberg. Well, this is what we need to do. If it's the tip of the iceberg, we need to blow the whistle on the rest of that iceberg. And yeah, I think sort of catch 22 is that if you blow that whistle, you may get a bullet in your head for some people and depending on whether they're police officers or whatnot. But we just said, I feel that we just need to band together well, I mean, surely you'd also think that it would, wouldn't be that difficult to, number one, uh, remove those guns from circulation, uh, find a way um, of, of, of just disarming people 
uh, who are in possession of these guns. It, it might seem like an impossible task, but we know they're there. And the second one is then, to, you know, when disciplinary processes happen. Uh, and and in the book, you write about also, you know, the SAP storerooms where these guns are, are, are left and how police themselves are selling these guns. Uh, so we've, we've got a whole culture um, of impunity that has, has, in a sense, trickled all the way down. Uh, and, and, and where there's resistance met, then... Uh, you know, how do, do community policing forums, you know, also the other thing, let's get, before we get to community policing forums, let's not forget uh, the benevolence of the gangs in communities that are caught up here. Um, that plays a very big role in people's sense of just survival and well-being in terms of food. Um, that has been a symbiotic relationship for a long time. It's sort of like, like it, it infuriates me in a sense, but it also highlights another issue, and it's a social issue. So we've got criminal suspects who dish out food, ampers, etc. And it's infuriating because, you know, like, it, these people are alleged, in some cases, they may have committed insane crimes. And here they are handing food parcels to the very people that they have in their criminal clutches. And... Who are we to say, oh, well, they shouldn't accept that? You know, we don't actually know, I don't know, hunger or it, to that extent. And that shows another failure on another level. And we get to joblessness or um, employment, etc. But it also shows you the cunning of gangsters, that they know where to tap in and they know where to sort of create so-called I don't want to go to support base because it's not necessarily support for them. It's more necessarily support for their handouts. But it shows that there is, I mean, it just shows that gangsters aren't necessarily just running around with firearms. There's a lot of planning and effort that goes into it. And they well, are I mean, a student government. They've, they've, learned, they've learned from the politicians who also in the Western Cape arrived with food parcels most of the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a common, whenever I think communities are being asked to, to sacrifice or give their vote, um, they are approached in the very same way. And, uh, and I mean, there's one story also of, uh, I don't think it's in your book, of a child who was wounded and the, 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 the gang who controls the area where the child was wounded pays for the child's uh, hospitalization and ongoing upkeep because the state cannot provide this so you know it is an alternative government but 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 the book for you ultimately is turning our gaze back to communities who are forced to live in these circumstances and the horror of getting up every day or being wounded by a flying bullet and it, this seems to be just taken for granted that people just have to get on with it and get used to it and that's where your outrage lies and that's where um, the damage um, it's just so visible and can't carry on. Kalia's death, hopefully, is this turning point. I'm um, just looking for any more um, questions from, from people listening in. Uh, Andrew Salaka says, would you say that some of the illicit money has been used by politicians? Absolutely, without a doubt. <laughs> I say that with no, I can't give you a document or something, but mm. I mean, we can uh, we hear what's coming out of the State Capture Commission, so... Yes, yes. Karen, we, we, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I, I hope we've been able to cover as much as we can. I, do, I really do think anyone who lives in Cape Town or in South Africa wants to understand this underworld, which is, which is a system and it exists and um, uh, who's in control of it, um, because it does have a lot of clout in terms of our own lives. From here, you're going to stay in this beat. You're going to keep, keep reporting. Um, you do lots of other writing as well, Karen, and you're a painter. And that painting at the back is your tribute to, uh, we'll auction it off later on. But um, uh, unfortunately, once you get into this trench, it's very difficult to get out when you see the after effects of it. Well, it's not about, I thought about it like that, but I've also thought about it this way. As a journalist who has spent, inadvertently spent years covering this, I have a little more of a foundation in terms of understanding what's happening and when something happens i can pin it i can now pin it to something that happened 10 years ago and what would i be doing as a journalist if i did not do that would i not be selling out in a sense because i can easily i do write about wonderful things nature etc but i do feel that i need to now use what i know and understand to take this forward i don't know if i'll do it on a permanent basis, but I can't just sort of say, oh, well, you know, now that this is out, I'm done. I've said my say. 
um, I must be responsible and use my knowledge and understanding to help other people to understand. And I think you've done that very, very expertly in this book. And I think for the rest of us too, that um, uh, once you know what you know um, and you see the people who are in this fight and why they're doing it and um, uh, in terms of pushing back, uh, then we need, they need and we need all the help we can get. So um, just a reminder, here's the book to the wolves. The title actually really does, was it difficult to select that? Is that what you feel? We've been the, left to the wolves? The title? Yeah, that, have we been left no. to the wolves? Have we I been was, left to the wolves? I feel that the title was, it was in me. <laughs> it wasn't a struggle or anything. I chose the title myself and the subtitle, but it, it was really something I felt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite clear in the book. And I mean, the thing is also sad that there are generations of young people who have never known what it is like uh, to live in a suburb where there isn't somebody controlling your street, controlling mothers with sons are petrified of, 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 of what the gangs or belonging to gangs does and the power it gives young people who essentially have been left hopeless. So it's a, a massive problem. Um, Massive failure from the state on this part. And thank you, Karen, for putting your life at risk and the work that you do and continue to do. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll arrest all the, all the bad apples and restructure the police service uh, because God knows people are suffering enough as it is. So thank you very much. Thank you. And just in closing off, if gangsters can do it, if they can create such a stronghold, then on the flip side, we can do the same. And I, say I agree. That attitude because you, yeah. you do say that with attitude because you and I have both seen that if you don't push back uh, and that I suppose freedom or the accomplishment of freedom or a sense of freedom uh, and, and we haven't even spoken about the DAANC mix in this as well where they get caught up and it's 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 completely inevitable that that both parties would be caught up so we need people like you to navigate us through the storm and the disinformation and everything else and please take care and thank you very much and uh, once again you can buy the book at the the daily maverick shop um there's a link to it somewhere else and thank you to all the insiders again we really appreciate you you make it possible for us to do this work um and for karen to take the time to do it rather than have to run and and, and meet deadlines all the time so thank you all 427 of you for for tuning in and karen thank you um thank you. and we'll we'll speak to you soon please take care and be safe everybody